entire world is constantly evolving. As time moves forward, things change, which is why it's important to stay informed. Throughout the year, there are dozens of professionals that share their expertise with the community through lectures sponsored by local government agencies and area not-for-profits. And each month, SLC TV will feature one of these visiting professors as they discuss the latest current events. So grab a notebook and pull up a chair, because the lecture hall is about to begin. I've been at the museum almost nine years. It's an honor to be there. Our, our uh, directors are former SEALs. So for the last nine years, I've been working for former SEALs, which makes it quite challenging if I have to work for regular people ever again, because it's a whole different mindset. It's, it, it's a lot of fun. So I'm going to show you, I have a, a PowerPoint and a short little video kind of explains everything, what we do at the museum, and then we'll go into the PowerPoint, and then I have a little film afterwards of the memorial to Extortion 17, the helicopter that got shot down a few years ago with all those SEALs on board. So. To be a Navy SEAL is teamwork. To be prepared. To be mentally tough. To always do the right thing. To never quit. To be in the best possible shape you can be in. Complete the mission. And never make excuses. The mission of the Navy SEAL Museum is to preserve the history and heritage of the Navy SEALs, honor our fallen at the Navy SEAL Memorial, and to take care of our families through the Trident House Charities Program. And we do that through this great place and educating the public. The Navy SEAL Museum is unique because everything that we have inside here, whether it be a weapon, whether it be a boat or whatever else you want to talk about is here has been used by Navy SEALs in combat or in training. It's all authentic stuff. In addition to honoring our frogmen, the history and heritage, and honoring the uh, guys at the Navy SEAL Memorial, we have Trident House Charities Program, which includes the Trident House, the Renewal Coalition, Scholarship Program, and it also includes Family Support the Trident House is a respite house that we use not only for the families of the fallen, but also for guys that are on active duty that just need a break from combat to reconnect with their family. It is a beautiful house on the Indian River. It's just a relaxing place where people just sit and talk and they reconnect. That's what the Trident House is for. The Renewal Coalition, with the help of the Navy SEAL Museum, gets wounded veterans whatever that family needs to get that break. The Renewal Coalition is one of the few places that can actually get these guys out of a hospital with his family. The other part of the uh, Trident House Charities Program is the uh, scholarship program, where we give scholarships to kids of all special operations forces, not only the Navy, but also of the Army, uh, to help them get a leg up on college costs. Family support is being able to help with anything that a guy may need that he can't get that help anywhere else. Whatever program that the guy is currently in doesn't cover, we will help. A memorial wall is a way that we honor every frogman that has died since World War II to the present day. 
We also hold a service every Veterans Day where we swim the ashes of our fallen frogmen that had passed that year. And it is quite an emotional ordeal, not only for the guys swimming out the ashes, but for all the families that are sitting there on the beaches watching this. The Navy SEAL Museum is a 501c3 organization. We do not receive federal support whatsoever. The museum runs itself through admissions and store sales, but the Trident House Charities program is totally on the backs of our donors that want to contribute to our families that need the assistance. And it is very important for us to keep that going because our families need the help. So thank you very much. So that gives you a little, uh, just a little glimpse into what we do besides having the coolest museum on the planet. We're the only museum on the planet dedicated strictly to preserving the history of naval special warfare, located right here in Fort Pierce. SEALs and their predecessors. Now, in 1985 it was open. If you're, y'all, everyone's been there, right? Good. So. If, I can make stuff up, they might know I'm making stuff up and you won't. <laughs> All right, so back in 1985, the only thing on North Hutchinson Island was uh, the neighborhood there by the inlet, one condo, and a building called the St. Lucie State Museum. It was a little round building, it was empty. So some frogmen and some seals went there to the county and said, listen, if we don't put something here, no one's ever gonna know what happened here. And in 1985, the museum opened, humbly. Some of the gentlemen I met that were, uh, SEAL Team 2 guys from Vietnam, they brought down whatever they had kept from the Navy and put it in there, and that's how it started. As Rick said in the video, everything you see in the museum is authentic. It's been in a battle or a, a battle or training. There are no replicas, so everything in there is real. Ancient dive gear, uh, this right here, these are obstacles that were left here. These are replicas of the obstacles at Normandy that were left here after the Navy left because, well, I can't tell you that part of the story because that comes later. SEAL, believe it or not, some people aren't sure what SEAL stands for. It is the three environments they operate in, sea, air, and land. Now, the main gallery, the Black Hawk helicopter, this is an Army helicopter. And the reason we obtained it, when Jess Buchanan and another guy were kidnapped in Somalia by the pirates, their job there was to train kids not to play with landmines. The Somalians knew who they were. They'd been there many times. They decided to uh, kidnap her and try to get some ransom money. Well, it got to the point where the SEALs had to go in there and get them out. They made quick work of the Somalians. When they flew her out, they flew her out in that helicopter right there. That's how we have it. There's only two Black Hawks in museums, and we have one. Like I said, this is an Army helicopter uh, by a group called the Night Stalkers. And they were formed in 1980 after the collision in the desert when they tried to rescue the Iranian hostages. Two things came out of it. Everybody uses the same radio, and one group of guys flies special forces, okay, the Night Stalkers. This is the same group that flew the SEALs to Bin Laden's house. Everybody saw the movie? Yes. So the lifeboats in the movie were replicas. Reason being is that once these lifeboats get on a ship, they stay on a ship for the life of the ship 20, 30 years and not laying around. So Sony Films goes, we'd like to use your boat for the movie. And we said, you're not touching that boat for the movie. So they came, measured, took pictures, went, went to Sweden, had two made for the movie at 100,000 apiece. Now, the part in the movie where Captain Phillips and the pirate were chatting, they cut that in half to film it. 
And by the way, Captain Phillips and the pirate never had the chat. That was Hollywood. They didn't speak one word for four days. Also, if you remember in the movie, the guy that set all sights on target, when they got ready to shoot the pirates, the actual guy was in the museum, being he's a former SEAL, and gave us a whole rundown on what happened. Korea. Now, during the Korean War, the frogmen, maritime, they left their maritime environment and went inland. They blew up bridges, uh, worked with the CIA to rescue prisoners of war. They also destroyed a harbor called Hung Nam Harbor. They evacuated all the Marines out of their chosen reservoir. After the, everybody got out, the frogmen put 20,000 tons of explosives and leveled the harbor so the Chinese couldn't use it. If you notice, that's one of the first dry suits. 36 degree water. Okay. In 1962, the SEAL teams were established. They took them all from the ranks of the frogmen. The SEALs were established to operate in the maritime environment in South Vietnam that the North Vietnamese were using against us. So we decided, well, if you're going to do that, so are we. So there was two SEAL teams from 1962 to 1983. All the seals came from the frogmen. That's why the museum is a UDT Frogman Museum. How many are there? 200-ish. Uh, they said 10 platoons, 17, 17, 10 platoons, 17 guys in a platoon. That doesn't count support group and everything else that goes with it. Now, this particular picture right here, this shotgun right here, uh, was owned by a gentleman named Chief Watson. He was one of the first guys to help run the museum, cured Emeritus. And uh, he wrote one of the first books before books became ridiculous. He didn't want to write the book, but it was in publication for 17 years and was called Point Man. And he walked point on SEAL patrols. The Point Man carried a shotgun, and that has a duckbill on it to shoot the shot this way so they could cut down trees, not blow a big hole. You can't hardly notice. There's an AK-47 right there. There's holes in that clip. There's, holes in, there's dents in the clip, and there's holes in that stock. Story goes, I was out one night, the guy had to drop on me, but I got him. So the holes, the damage to the AK-47 came from that shotgun, which, by the, by the way, is named Sweetheart. Medal of Honor, seven Navy SEALs are Medal of Honor recipients. Mike Thornton was at our, we have a big event in November, Muster. Mike Thornton was our guest speaker, that, that gentleman right there. Now, Tommy Norris got the Medal of Honor for rescuing the, the Air Force pilot, and you may have heard the story, Bat 21. Air Force pilot got shot down in Vietnam, had too much knowledge to get captured by the North Vietnamese. He got shot down in the middle of 3,000 North Vietnamese. So the Air Force lost three helicopters and 12 guys trying to get him out. They sent Tommy Norris in, plucked him right out of there, got the Medal of Honor. Later on, Thornton and Norris were sent on a mission to recon for an amphibious assault. They got put in the wrong place. They were inserted into another giant camp in North Vietnamese. The three South Vietnamese guys with them decided they were going to start some trouble. A big gunfight broke out. They all escaped. Tommy got shot in the face. He has a glass eye. Thornton rescued them all. Thornton got the Medal of Honor for rescuing Norris. Never in the history of the military has one Medal of Honor guy ever rescued another. Just some more of the uh, displays that you see now. So history goes backwards. It starts with current issues, current events, because people want to see all that. They see it on the news. They read the books. They want to see that. So right now, you're coming from the modern section to Vietnam to Korea into the World War II room. All right. So I can, I can sneak into your question a little bit. During World War II, all right, hang on, we'll make it more authentic. Well, look at that. Why is it in four pairs? Well, I'm glad you asked. During World War II, the whole state of Florida has training throughout. As people weren't living here in the 40s like today, it's a swamp. There's no mosquito control. We all know good. Nothing comes from no air conditioning. So the Navy came down there, and straight across the river right there, they built a 20,000-acre amphibious training base starting with the invasion of Normandy, followed by the rest of the war. 130,000 guys went to that facility. 
They chose to put the base here in Fort Pierce because it had an inlet only a population of 8,000, which was a building boom because World War I, the population was 4,000. So the first group to arrive were called Scouts and Raiders. A amphibious reconnaissance group, they operated in Europe, Pacific, the Rice Paddy Navy, and China. These guys had already seen combat, North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, and they came here. Now the gentleman that started this whole thing happened to be the guy that started the bomb disposal school, so he couldn't blow up anything. On his way down here, he was ordered to come to Fort Pierce to clear Hitler's beaches. He stopped in Williamsburg, Virginia at a CB base, Camp Perry, and got CBs who could blow up everything, and then they showed up. So the first group to arrive were called Scouts and Raiders, like I told you. Um, have you heard of Hell Week? If you're to be a Navy SEAL today, you, in your fourth week in training, of your 26 weeks of basic training, you get a week where they give you four hours of sleep. And the reason you get four is three could kill you. So when the Scouts and Raiders arrived, Draper was getting ready for war. He goes, listen, we're in a little bit of a hurry. Can you get your PT done in one week? The guys, it was called Orientation Week. The guys changed the name to Hell Week, and it stuck. That picture right there was taken in front of the Inlet Bar and Grill. So Hell Week started right across on, on South Hudson Island. And did they do the same sort of trainings that they do in present day? Hell week? Actually, Hell Week is kind of pretty much the same as it was then and today. So they decided to continue that as part of a tradition, or? Well, to see if you can make it. So sometimes, all right, my boss is in a 24-hour gun battle. 24 hours. That's like from 3.30 to 3.30 tomorrow. So it's just to see if you can put up with the stress in and, and, and combat, so, and physically and mentally. All right, so the next group that were formed here, NCDU, Naval Combat Demolition Units. Those are the guys that cleared the obstacles at Normandy. They, like everyone else, took a beating, 52% casualty rate. Still the largest loss in Naval Special Warfare today. Now, as you can tell, they weren't swimming at Normandy. They paddled up in rubber boats. They only got half their lanes cleared. They were supposed to clear 16. They only got eight. It was enough to get the invasion over. If you saw the movie Save a Private Ryan in the beginning scenes, I used to work with a gentleman that lived through that and said that scene was pretty accurate. Our guys were hiding behind the obstacles that were already timed so they wouldn't get shot. And so. Now, the Marines invade Tarawa, the first Japanese fortified island. Old maps from the British, pictures of beach and periscopes of submarines, they missed a few things. The first three waves came in and uh, tracked vehicles, any low spots, high spots in the reef, they'd drive right over. The fourth wave came in a landing craft, the tide had dropped, they hit the reef 500 yards offshore, dropped their ramps, Marines charged out, 40% of the wave perished. So right there they said, okay, tactics must change. As the Naval Combat Demolition Units paddled boats to Normandy, the coast of France, you cannot paddle boats around the reefs in the Pacific. So in the water you go, the underwater demolition teams known as the Frogmen were created. Thirty teams trained right here in Fort Pierce, went to the Pacific, and were very successful. All right, it all, so North Hutchinson Island is the birthplace of Naval Special Warfare. Volunteer only. Um, they really didn't know what they're getting in for. I've heard stories. If you hate your job in the Navy, you want to go to Daytona, get on the train, and get in, f and, and get on the train to Daytona. Here's the thing: the train never stopped in Daytona. Came right to Fort Pierce. And what they did it with was a pack of explosives, a face mask, fins, and a knife. And that was it. The greatest generation. Well, I've heard stories that if you lived in Fort Pierce during World War II, it was constant explosions, and you cannot go to the beach. No beach for you. Because where the museum sits, so everybody lived on that island. No one lived on North Island. So where the museum sits, approximately, they built a giant compound over there. And from 10 miles north down to the St. Lucie Inlet is where the demolition guys did their work for their seals or frogs. This particular picture. One time, the frogmen decided to do a re recon off a submarine on the island of Yap. Well, they didn't do well. They got captured and it appeared to be executed. They wanted to do it again. The state goes, it's way too dangerous. 
One day a guy, a, a guy about my age walked in there with this, that picture on his phone. He goes, this guy's my dad. I said, well, how could he be? He got killed. He goes, no, he was waiting in the boat for them to come back. There you go. There's your hell week again. There's Naval Combat Demolitions. Now, that particular group there is called Anderson's Avengers because the commander, the lieutenant, was named Anderson. Said all these guys had their own names for their teams. It's in the Fort Pierce Inlet. There's your Frogman. These pictures back from World War II. Note all the obstacles. Finally, about five years ago, they got the last obstacle out of the water. That's how long it's taken to get them all out. There you go. There's 1985. And there's the building. Not much, huh? Experience huge growth. So in 1993, they built this middle section right here, and it sat like that till 2011. So we are a nonprofit, as, as it was stated. We don't get federal funding, so we raised all the money ourselves and built this building in 2011. I think it'll be four or five years next month we open that building as you see it today. And then we open the middle section a year after that and World War II a year after that. Right now we get between 62 and 70,000 people. Now, this particular, the Naked Warrior was modeled by a frogman who was a retired Indian River County Sheriff. And being, now that we have, uh, that mold from our statue, we built, put one in Oahu at Waimanala, because when the, when the frogman left Fort Pierce, they went to Waimanala for some more training, and then they got deployed to the Pacific. So we put one there. Coronado is where the SEALs train, do our basic training today. And our last one is at a memorial in Virginia Beach on 38th Street. All from the mold from the statue at the museum here. Anybody interested? Of course you are. Doesn't sound bad. Swim 500 yards. 500. You can rest for 10 minutes. Minimum 50 push-ups, two minutes. Sit-ups, 50, two minutes rest. Pull-ups, 10. I can do that. Not after doing all that. And then run one, rest 10 minutes and run 1.5 miles. What do you think? Got it? No. Buds, basic on the order of demolition school. This is where two out of 10 guys make it to be a SEAL. It's an 80% dropout rate. I'm sure that water they're laying in is ice cold. Ice cold. And I, I guarantee those guys are soaking wet doing that. They just probably laying, met them laying in the water and rolling the sandy, call it wet and sandy. Sugar cookies. So anyway, the objective of the museum is to remain the promotion of public education for the SEALs and the SEAL Memorial and our charities. So I've, when we built that memorial, all the current guys, I've done, we do etchings for the family, rubbings on there, and I, I do them all, and I tell you what, man, there's been some pretty rough moments up there with the, the mothers of the SEALs. Memorial. 301 names on there. Trident House Charities. So that house is seldom empty of Gold Star families or seals that need to reconnect, like Rick said in the video. It was donated to us by a couple up in Sebastian. Scholarship Fund. Everyone's favorite, our new canine project. 
So Raven is our dog, museum dog right there. He's a Belgian Malinois. He's trained in protection, uh, bomb detection, and tracking. We made a relationship with a group out of Canada called Bad and Canine. It just kind of happened, and things have progressed to the point now that uh, we donate dogs to, they, through our program, they donate dogs to veterans that need a dog. So, have the, so the veteran will have a dog to help him. Uh, we've given away three already. Yeah, Raven's the star of the show, I'm going to tell you right now. He's ridiculous. He's very opportunistic. Males, male male laws are definitely more troublemakers or out looking for a fight than females. And that's our handler's daughter. So just go to show, they have the switch. They're not your house pet, but if you give them the right commands, you better look out. All right, we have a few events. We have the, our annual muster, which is we do sealed demos. We have guest speakers. We have music, food, and adult beverages. It honors the um, anniversary of the museum. Next year will be number 34. Back in the olden days, we could do it in the backyard, but we've expanded. We have to do it in the field north of us and put all the food trucks in the backyard. We get around 8,000 people. It's raving again. So we do, we do a takedown with the... Uh, Actually, these are the guys that we got our dog from. So they dress as terrorists and write bad things on the car, and then we put the dogs on them. It's pretty cool. When that dog sees a bite suit, the guy that's wearing, there's no New England fans here, is it? Because he's wearing a Tom Brady jersey. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anyway, man, Raven sees a bite suit. He, we tur he turns into the fur missile. So one day I was at an event. Actually, I was at a party in the park when I used to be with the Conservation Alliance, when it celebrates the anniversary of North Beach, North, the park on North Beach, that was gonna be condos and a marina until the Conservation, Conservation Alliance got enough signatures together and the state bought it and made it a park. So I knew these guys called the Indian River Woodcarver. I said, hey man, I hear you make canes for Purple Heart veterans. He goes, we do. I said, well, how do you get them out? He goes, well, we go to their house or maybe we do it at the Moose. I said, why don't we try it at the museum to see what happens? So we did. Now we get 500 people and they do 60 canes every year. Be careful what you wish for. And I'll tell you what, some of the guys, it's, some, it's pretty cool. Memorial Day. Uh, each Memorial Day, if we have to add names to the wall, we do and then we unveil them there. Um, I'm not sure how many we have this year. It, and the, the criteria for that wall is combat and combat training. So right now, no SEALs have been killed in combat up to this point this year. Training items that may have taken place in the past, they debate about it, whether it's, you know, fits criteria. We get about 500 people for that. There you go.